from Microbe TV. This is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 37, recorded on January 16, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Morning, Vincent. Hey, everyone. I understand you got a lot of snow there. It's been insane. We've <laughs> uh, my house, which is up in the mountains. We've had probably about five feet of snow. Um, so yeah, a little crazy. Wow. <laughs> is five feet unusual, or does that happen every winter? Um, no, I mean, this is the wettest we've had in Salt Lake or in the mountain, the Wasatch for the last 40 years, I think. Um, mm -hmm. we've already, the mountains already reached the snowpack that we had all of last season. Um, so the wet weather that's been hitting California gets, gets, uh, to us as well. But it's mm -hmm. good. It's good for the drought. Good for, uh, yeah. filling up that <laughs> lake, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from Hong Kong, Tim Chung. Hey, Vincent. Hi, everyone. I'm actually back from Hong Kong to I'm New sorry. York. I'm Also okay. joining us from New York, Tim Chung. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. You know, I was going to say your connection is much better today. Mm -hmm. No, I, oh, gee, I wonder why. <laughs> that's less ping, less lag. Yes, I'm just yeah. four blocks away, something like that. The, the last one was very hard to edit, I have to tell you. Yeah. Is, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. It's not your fault. It is uh, the, you're many thousands we need, of miles We need away. a faster speed of light. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from New Orleans, Vivian Morrison. Hey guys. What's the weather like this time of year? Is it like 70-ish? Actually, yeah, it was 65 yesterday. Or actually, no, it's 65 today, I think. It's a little overcast, but oh, I love it. I mean, not the overcast. Uh, the 65 but, uh, part, yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, we went up to Nashville uh, to see some friends because that's where we moved from about six months ago. And there was like, you know, like this much snow on the ground. Like there'd clearly been some more uh, before we got there. And it was really cold. And I was just like, yeah, I don't miss this at all. <laughs> I mean, if I'm, if I was somewhere like Jason, where I could go skiing, it would be a different story, but they just don't have great skiing in, uh, in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> or New Orleans. Or yeah. Yeah. Mountains. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, no. uh, here in, in they built a indoor ski rink or whatever, hill, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I used to drive, I used to pass it on the New Jersey Turnpike. It's this big, uh, big thing sloping. It's, isn't that weird? It's a big amusement type area and it's got an indoor ski thing. Do they have snow inside? Yeah, they make snow oh, and wow. they, okay. you know, they keep it cold so mm -hmm. it doesn't melt and uh, people go and they pay money to do this. It's crazy. It's not a, you know, it's not a huge run. It's, but it's a, it's a run. It's better than nothing because uh, in New Jersey, I don't think there are any ski areas as far as I know. They're all in Pennsylvania and New York. So mm -hmm. I sometimes see people on their ski in Central Park when it's snowing. Uh, cross country but, skis? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, or like yeah. the tiny little slopes. Yeah, but we don't get much snow anymore. Last winter, we didn't get any snow. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't get any this winter as well. But today is about uh, neuroscience, not snow. <laughs> and uh, Vivian's going to walk us through our paper today. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. So this is not a primary research article that we're talking about today. Um, and it's sort of a review paper, but actually, you know, what it is called, it was published in Neuron in November of 2022, and it's actually a perspective piece. So it definitely has, um, you know, significant elements of a review, but they offer the authors, which uh, the author list spans three pages, <laughs> um, they offer more of their perspective. Um, it was actually, the, so the first author is... Um, Rosa Palicelli, and she's at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, which I always get a kick out of because, as I'm sure I've mentioned before, um, I was uh, I did some schooling at the University of Lausanne and worked in some laboratories there. So it's always cool to see that um, popping up again. 
And then there are uh, three other names that were, or three other individuals, women actually, who are um, the corresponding authors. So that's Amanda Sierra, she's in Spain. Beth Stevens, um, who is uh, MIT, I think. She's right, Harvard. A mul- mul- yeah, Harvard. Um, yeah, huh. Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Huh, who knows? And then um, Mary Eve Tremblay, who is in Canada. Um, so they're all corresponding authors on this. And then they have this enormous list of um, of authors that it, it's uh, alphabetically ordered. So, um, and the reason their names are all on there is because um, the the people the the main authors put together uh, a questionnaire. And they sent it out to all of these people. And this questionnaire has to do with uh, microglia and um, the nomenclature that we used to talk about it. So the title of the paper is Microglial States and Nomenclature, a Field at Its Crossroads, um, which I feel like, you know, everything's always at a crossroads. So, you know, <laughs> um, but I guess it was just time, you know, there was enough craziness going on in the field of microglial studies that um, some of the... Uh, big names in the field said, listen, we have to sit down and kind of, you know, sort things out a little bit. So this uh, questionnaire, which um, you can access, it's only one page, but um, I can tell you some of the questions that are on it, but it was used to create uh, or to collect the opinions of all of these authors on um, some issues of nomenclature, so how we talk about microglia, and we'll talk about what microglia are as best as we can. Um, and then from that, they you know they had a couple of meetings with everybody, and then they wanted to decide on some recommendations, some do's and don'ts of how to talk about microglia, and then, um, but just generally wanted to raise awareness about these nomenclature issues, and then stimulate uh, activity in the field um, to create like further initiatives, which I think that's what the, the words that they use. And I, I suggest that just means that, you know, periodically return to these questions, reevaluate where we are and make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, so as the name implies, uh, this paper is talking about microglia. So way back when we had a uh, an episode that was central nervous system glia 101, we talked about oligodendrocytes and astrocytes and microglia. Um, and what's cool about microglia is that uh, we'll talk a little bit about where they come from, but I think the thing that kind of <clears throat> grabs people's attention at first is that microglia actually aren't born in the central nervous system. They come from outside the central nervous system, which is very interesting and from an evolution perspective, I just have to wonder how that happened. They got um, lost. They got lost and it turned out to be good. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're something. Like, they're like my, macrophages. They're sort of similar lineage to macrophages, which obviously are, are part of the immune system. Mm. I think evolution does this a lot where it sort of just, if something seems useful, it commandeers that for something else. Yeah. And I guess you could consider the microglia as kind of the immune cell of the brain, where they're sort of surveilling health and, you know, activity. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, in, and, sorry, mm-hmm. just follow on Jason, I think that in other organs, you also have um, tissue resident macrophages that come from outside of those organs. And it seems to be like a, a giant movement of these cells that when you are very early in development to go to every single organs to, to, to do whatever they do. Mm-hmm. Right. So when they're circulating in the in the blood, they're called monocytes. And then once they enter into a tissue and adapt properties that are specific to that tissue and its needs, then they take on that, as Tim said, the tissue resident macrophage label. And they have oh, um, but, but I think, different names. But I have a sneak. I'm not an immunologist, but from, from what I read, I think some of those circulating monocytes might still come from yet another lineage compared to these tissue resident macrophage. Because the circulating uh, monocyte might be coming from the bone marrow and mm-hmm. kind of appear later. But these uh, tissue resident macrophage, such as microglia and like all these other cells, like Langerhans cells in the pancreas and stuff, um, they come from the yolk sac um, when you are still an embryo, I'm guessing. 
uh, something like that. I don't know whether there's any, I misspoke or anything, but that's my impression. Well, I think uh, I, you're correct. Um, but even within this paper, there's, uh, it's clear that it's, there's not a consensus about those, about mm -hmm. some of the, those things. But um, as Jason mentioned, just to get back to what, you know, what microglia are, what they do, um, they are most famous for their role as being the immune cell of the brain because of, as we were talking about, their relationship to macrophages, which um, play a role in presenting um, material that they have engulfed to uh, like proper immune cells that would then be capable of generating an immune response. Um, so, you know, T cells and eventually B cells. Um, but as we have been learning um, for uh, several decades now, but still it's relatively young. I mean, we, were, we had figured out how to do PCR which was in the 80s, before people really started publishing on microglia. So there are very few papers published on microglia between, uh, between when they were uh, discovered um, and the 1990s. So um, now we're learning, like I said, in the past several decades that they have way more jobs. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, astrocytes. They kind of end up doing everything. Um, and that's actually an interesting um, thing for all of us to keep in mind also is kind of how astrocytes and microglia have a lot of kind of overlapping or intermingling roles. And so I think there's going to be some interesting papers out there about like, why do these things that on the surface look the same coexist? How redundant are they? Or do they actually, you know, they look the same at a, at a macro level, but they actually serve different purposes. Um, but we know that microglia are involved in neurogenesis. And in fact, that's the work that um, I've been doing in the past several years is they, microglia will regulate the degree and the kind of proliferation that neural stem cells do. And they also play a significant role in regulating uh, the migration of newborn neurons to their, uh, their destination and then promoting the survival of those neurons. They also play a significant, the microglia play a significant role in synaptic pruning um, which uh, is basically just, you know, we're born, and this is a theme, as I may have said before in previous episodes, there's a theme in biology and developmental biology where you generate too much of something just to make sure you have enough, and then you can kind of cut back depending on what ends up being advantageous, um, broadly speaking. I'm sure that, uh, Jay, I mean, I know Jason knows a lot more about this. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one, you, it's one can think before. of it as sort of like, you know, trees that are pruned to make certain shapes and that's how the nervous mm -hmm. system is sculpted it, it kind of you need that blank slate that um with that sort of allows it, the the brain to adapt to its environment that's mm -hmm. yeah that's certainly something that we're interested in looking you know in investigating but in general there's this idea that yeah you have way too many synapses and then they get pruned over time yeah, and the, the mechanism by which that happens actually is um, you know, very much associated with the immune system. It, reply, it relies on um, a kind of uh, axis of signaling molecules called the complement system, which is involved in the periphery in um, uh, tagging things that should not be there so that the immune cells will recognize it and um, kill it, engulf it, do whatever they have, whatever they're programmed to do. Um, and, uh, so, you know, it kind of just makes sense that you would want to like make sure you don't have too much of something. You want to have the right amount, but like, what is that, you know, what is the outcome of that really? Like if that is dysfunctional, what happens? And so, um, I'm not an expert on it, but the, the way I think about it is the things I've heard is that, you know, if you have too much pruning, then you end up, that's associated with things like schizophrenia. If you have not enough pruning, then you start developing, or you that's associated with the development of autism, for example. And I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but in general, when scientists will look at the number of spines, for example, which is one half of a synapse, you might find too few of them in some neurodegenerative neuropathological situations and then too many in others. 
Yeah, I think um, the, the role of microglia in, in sculpting during normal development is emerging. I would say there's sort of conflicting um, reports out there and sort of how important they are and it sort of varies on which which part of the brain you're looking at. But I think for sure they're they're involved in some way and I think this is the the reason why we're sort of getting to the the point where we have to classify the different kinds of microglia because some seem to be um, you know, used, most of the uh, studies so far have been sledgehammers because you basically get rid of all of them in some way or you destroy all of them in some way. Or you, uh, you are speaking my language because I make this argument in a, a paper that was actually just accepted today of review on the role of phagocytosis in stroke. And um, I literally use that word and then uh, a sledgehammer approach. Um, and it's just, you know, I guess that's what we've been able to do up until now, but there's just been this explosion of new techniques and people are starting to, you know, integrate different methodologies. And so, like, hopefully, you know, in the coming years, we will just have, um, I mean, it's a little bit, uh, we'll have so much more, but you guys have probably heard the the saying, the more you know, the less you know, mm-hmm. or something like that. <laughs> oh, <yeah. That's laughs> the science. more you learn, the less you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, you know, we've mentioned a couple times that microglia also serve the role as the as the immune cell of the brain. So they're involved in um, mounting inflammatory responses. Um, so they'll make inflammatory molecules that will recruit peripheral immune cells to come in and help with what or or you know yeah, help uh, with whatever's happening. And inflammation is uh, a good thing to a point. I mean, it's an adaptive response that was good for something. Um, But then for reasons that we're still trying to work out, sometimes it becomes out of of control and and then you start to see these kind of neurodegenerative things developing or an acute injury that can't be resolved because the inflammation is just unhinged. Um, Um, Viviana, I've got a quick question. So when microglia are doing all the synaptic pruning and and promoting neurogenesis early in development, um, are they using the same kind of programs, kind of molecular programs and gene expression programs as they would if they are detecting and fighting against an inflammation? I mean, that's a great question and actually something that um, now I bring up in, I'm just like advertising myself, uh, <laughs> bring up in the paper uh, mm. that I, the review I just wrote as well as a uh, um, the primary research that we're going to be submitting hopefully this week, um, that question of, uh, you know, maybe it's maybe the same receptors on the surface are being used, but depending on, you know, for, so if you have a, a transmembrane receptor, they have these um, parts of the receptors on the inside of the cell that can be modified by kinases. So that we'll bring, um, we'll phosphorylate them. Those, you um, those domains, and this leads to a signaling cascade that, you know, among other things, can ch- change gene transcription. So you might have the same receptor, but depending on what's happening inside the cell or maybe adjacent to that receptor at a given time, that could potentially have uh, a different outcome. Um, I think there's very little known about what receptors on the outside of microglia are detecting, what are they binding to, and how, you know, can they bind to multiple different targets? Um, and then how does that differentially affect the signals that they propagate? Um, certainly there are, there's overlap, for sure. Um, they're all, the, the receptors are pattern recognition receptors, so there are certain things that occur, uh, certain, you know, sequences of, you um, of nucleic acids or amino acids that are going to be recognized by those receptors, the, but the context in which those things appear is going to be will, will differ. And, um, and there is evidence that that uh, complement cascade is involved in that synaptic pruning. Um, what's I think not really clear is how those synapses are tagged um, for being um, removed, and is there specificity? And this is where I think. Um, in the context of inflammation, because there is crosstalk between the same kinds of pathways, you get overactivation of the pathway in inflammation, you get abnormal pruning, too many synapses getting uh, removed, and that's part of the whole sort of 
dysfunction you get in, in inflammation and neurodegeneration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so on the flip side, the microglia also can make anti-inflammatory molecules that can you know, help protect neurons um, or, or certain receptors that will, that'll be like a, a no-go receptor where it says don't phagocytose this thing, don't engulf this thing, don't prune this synapse. Um, they're able, these anti-inflammatory molecules are able to suppress inflammatory responses in neighboring cells um, and like reduce the, the homing of peripheral immune cells to the brain. Um, and because of like their role in inflammation, you know, either pro or anti-inflammatory pathway activation, they control or they contribute to tissue repair. Um, and they also contribute to the generation of uh, blood vessels in the developing brain, but also in the mature adult brain. So they're involved in, um, for example, after stroke, um, where you you know you have a stroke where there's this uh, basically oxygen and and glucose and fuel um, delivery has been stopped because the blood vessel is plugged by a clot, and microglia are part of um, stimulating angiogenesis or so the production of new blood vessels in an attempt to revascularize reintroduce oxygen and resources to the tissue. Um, not always a good thing, but the, that is a discussion for some other episode. Um, and then very closely related to that and super important is microglial's role in impacting the blood-brain barrier. So blood-brain barrier is actually, um, it's a multi, there's a couple of different cell types that are involved in creating it. It's basically a physical and biochemical barrier between the brain tissue and the periphery, peripheral tissue, blood, immune cells, all of that stuff. Um, and there's some really interesting, uh, and astrocytes play a significant role in that. Um, in fact, I don't know what percentage it is of the brain vasculature, they actually probably be all of it, is covered with astrocytic end feet. So when we look at blood vessels in the brain, what you'll probably see is a bunch of astrocytes and underneath there, inside that, uh, are blood vessel cells. And um, so during ischemic events, during stroke, the astrocytes, endothelial cells might start dying or they're create, the endothelial cells make up the blood vessels. They're either dying or they're sending out their own signals that um, recruit, cell, recruit immune cells or microglia to that particular location. And the astrocytic end feet will like lift off and the blood-brain barrier becomes permeable. And microglia are actually shown using some of the receptors that are involved in pattern recognition and migration and all of that. They use those receptors to find their way to the blood vessel and to physically plug the holes that are generated, which is uh, was really unexpected since most people in the field of stroke uh, have thought about the microglia as being largely... Um, detrimental to the blood-brain barrier. And um, so, you know, we've used techniques like Jason was saying, sledgehammer techniques, where you just knock out all inflammation. You try to get rid of, um, get rid of the whole population. And not surprisingly, uh, that en ends up being just as bad uh, because they have positive effects as well. Um, so that's kind of a um, 30,000 foot view of what they do. So it's basically everything. Um, <laughs> uh, so this paper though, you know, they don't focus a lot on that, but I, we go through that just for the um, benefits of, you know, trying to communicate why we should be caring about these cells because they're involved in so many different things. Um, but this paper, it's really about how do we talk about those cells? How do we capture all of those things that they do and differentiate between the cells doing those things at different times? How do we use the correct language for that? Um, so historically, biology, and we're, this is gonna be like a philosophical discussion probably at times. Um, historically, like biology's kind of modus operandi has been categorizing the natural world so that we can try to understand it, like taxonomy. Thing. What is the thing? If we call it something, then we can start understanding what it is. Um, but the authors here argue that we need to realize that this categorization is actually a construct. 
it may or may not actually be real. Um, and so we've, and this is partially based on immunology research, what we have adopted uh, in the microglial field is using this dichotomy, inflammatory, anti-inflammatory versus inflammatory, activated versus resting, M1, M2 phenotypes, uh, classically activated versus alternatively activated. So all of those things, you know, generally are speaking about the same thing, but they're all, and they're all dichotomies, which uh, we're now realizing is not, does not reflect the heterogeneity of the population. And so really isn't that meaningful. So again, the premise is we just need to figure out we need, how do we talk about these cells? So as we talked about a little bit earlier, the origin of microglia is not inside the central nervous system, it's outside. And like Tim said, the microglia in the first week of life in mice and in the first one to two months in humans um, come out of the embryonic yolk sac and they migrate somehow, <laughs> they migrate to the brain. And we're starting to learn how, about how they get there. Um, but I think it's really underdeveloped at this point, our understanding of that. Um, and in this paper, they only mentioned the yolk sac, but there are data showing that the, the liver is also involved in generating microglia. Maybe they didn't bring that up um, because of what we're here to discuss, which is, you know, what, do we, what, use, what words do we use to talk about tr true microglia? And, and like, actually, here, so Mario Capecchi of you know, Nobel Laureate fame has this story that they stumbled on of a different origin um, mm -hmm. of microglia um, using their sort of Hox, Hox gene um, mice. And it was sort of unexpected. They had knocked out all these Hox genes, which kind of are sort of master transcription factors that control the expression of a bunch of different genes, and found that in one of the mice that they made, they had knocked out just this one lineage of microglia. And the reason why I'm sort of bringing it up is that um, the phenotype of these mice is dramatically, you know, very dramatic. They, they have this crazy OCD phenotype to the point where they, they overgroom their fur and, 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 and you know, tearing their hair out. Um, and uh, Literally. Yeah, literally, to, to the point where there's blood. Um, and... Um, it's it's another unexpected, um, and it, I, they have sort of tried to get mechanism at this, and I don't think they they really know what's going on there. But this is just to say that, yeah, this is just one example of a, a lineage that was not um, known until they stumbled on this. And not only is there specificity in the lineage in terms of where they um, come from, but then the function of these microglia seem to be doing one specific or a couple of specific. Um, um, things in the brain that ultimately control some complex behavior, which is really interesting. It's really fascinating. Um, so, just 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 to clarify, these mice still have some other microglia, but one subpopulation of microglia is now yeah. missing. They actually have more micro, yep. like this population that he's talking about, are very small. Yep. compared uh, to all of the other yeah. ones, and yet that large population of microglia, for whatever reason, cannot compensate for the loss of this. Hawks was it like Hawks eight or B or something that yeah that Hawks eight B or something yeah um, it's that's nuts that, and so the the other thing that I really like about that paper because it's it um, it kind of mirrors something um, that I just had to fight with during my uh, dissertation my doctoral studies was that um. You know, this population of, of microglia that are this, um, the Hawks B8 microglia, it, there's, it's a very small population, and yet it's having this huge impact. And people have difficulty accepting that idea. It's like, if you have a lot of something, it must be very important. And if you have very little of something, like, how could it possibly be important? Um, and I had to, I ran up against that a lot um, when I was publishing the, the paper that culminated, the, the, the product of my dissertation. Um, that how is it possible that this very small population of perivascular cells that generate uh, a small amount of retinoic acid could have such dramatic effects on neural stem cells to the point that it changes the layer structure 
of the cortex and um, dramatically reduces myelination. I had to, <laughs> I had to make a really good argument. But people have difficulty um, difficulty accepting that. But I'm really hoping that you know, work like my own papers, like like the Hawks B8 um, paper, can you know start showing people like you don't just because there's a lot of something doesn't make it more important than something that there's not so much of. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they're, the microglia are derived from the yolk sac and probably, and the liver, because those Hawks B8 microglia come from the liver. Um, and the cells will locally proliferate in the brain and migrate, and then they kind of reach this steady state um, in, the, in the adult brain. And then during inflammation, they'll proliferate locally. You'll have recruitment of those monocytes uh, and macrophages into the brain. And there's a recent paper that suggests that there's actually this kind of like low level chronic accumulation of peripherally derived monocytes in the brain and that they may be um, a contributing factor for like for cognitive decline. And then um, why uh, uh, there's just such uh, a strong like why neurodegeneration happening in an aged brain is can be so um, so powerful, so detrimental. Um, and so then we use like a, a group of um, markers to, to to look to be able to identify microglial populations versus um, macrophage populations that have come into the brain. Um, so uh, you know we we. Think about microglia as just this like big population, but now with the um, advent of RNA sequencing technology, uh, <laughs> we yeah. actually right. realizing that um, there's uh, a lot more uh, subgroups. But um, actually, one of the recommendations that they use in this paper is to not use the word subpopulation or sub uh, subgroup, and instead to use the word state. Um, so. Uh, they also say not that they they say avoid using acronyms whenever possible, but uh, we're going to use them right now. We have BAMs, CAMs, DAMs, HAMs, WAMs, YAMs, PAMs, DIMs, and then I think there are uh, at least nine other acronyms. And all of these acronyms, they, the, the AM is associated microglia, so you'll have the disease-associated microglia, of which there are actually multiple kinds. Um, there are human AD microglia, white matter associated microglia, proliferative zone associated microglia. This is where microglia. I start to get, uh, have an issue with the sort of, you know, stamp collecting, what I call stamp collecting. Where, stamp collecting. And this is, and also maybe it's philosophical at this point, but, you know, there's sort of two main ways that, pe that scientists are trying to classify things. One is function. So what do they do? But then also what makes them do that function? And that the the general field has gone to this sort of um, omics uh, mm -hmm. way of classifying, which yep. things are you know gene expression, protein expression, um, metabolic changes, and then they sort of try to make sense of all these different snapshots that they take of these cells to say, okay, maybe this is a different functional thing. And that's where I'm just skeptical where it's like, well, yeah, you took a snapshot of like a thousand genes, a thousand proteins. And now you're saying this thing is completely different to something that you took a snapshot like a few seconds ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's kind of like when in fact it was the same thing. Right? In the immune system, yeah. people use markers to find new cells and they say, oh, maybe they have a different function. It's mm -hmm. kind of similar, except not on a RNA-seq level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so these um, these acronyms, these functional states, um, are supposed to capture a time, uh, a cluster of core markers, some sort of functional state, and sometimes a place or a region in the brain. And like Jason was saying, the functional states are a combination of data that we collect from all the ohms. Mm. Secretome, sensome, Epigenome, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome. I mean, you, you just make up anything. A lipidome, I think that's one I've heard. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just people trying to wrap their heads around all of this data. Um, but 
uh, so the other thing I think is interesting about this, like, you know, is related, it's basically, yeah, it's related to what Jason was just saying, is that none of these things can, or can adequately capture what was happening before and after, or like what was happening before you collected the tissue. Like we have no way of tracking or like, I can only think of like, there's like at least very few ways that we can track like the personal history of a cell and know because whatever it is when you looked at it is a product of whatever happened before it, uh, before that. And um, like, I, I don't know how we're going to get access to that information or that we would even be able to like, understand it if we saw it just because of like the way the human brain works or the way that I mean my brain works because you know I'm a product of you know how generations uh, behind me you know saw the world and set it up you know again philosophical but I think that that is the that being unable to track the life history of a cell and understand what it's been through in its history is a big um, issue. I don't know how it will be addressed, but yeah, I, and then, I, I totally agree. I mean, the and I, that t the time, the being able to sort of follow the same cell over time um, is really key, and and it is going to be a very difficult um, technical barrier. I know I saw a paper the other day that sort of tried to get at this by sampling tissue or t sampling fluids uh, very quickly and then doing, you know, this omics um, where it's sort of um, in, you know, in neuroscience, we covered this technique called patch clamping where you stick a little glass electrode into the cell, make a small hole. And they were doing that with these cells where they could put a small hole in the cell and then just sample over time mm. um, <laughs> things that were happening to that cell. Amazing. Very difficult to do in, in things like, you know, structures like the brain, of course. What um, are they looking at? Like, is it... And also, you know, it's it's a is microphage. Or something, a macrophage, I think. Oh, that's uh, crazy. As far as I can remember. Are they amplifying things from the inside? Yeah, it's... it was sort of this um, very, yeah, <laughs> technical <laughs> tour de force of going and sampling RNA from a cell over time and then, uh, you know, being, subjecting it to sequencing. Um but yeah, I mean, you know, every every cell, every kind of cell will have dynamics and and slight variations in gene expression, and so then the key is trying to figure out which one of those genes is actually changing the state of the cell. Um, and I guess this is what they're trying to establish in this paper is or review is are there a sort of master regulators, master markers that that, that would define a state of the cell. Um, I'm just wondering, um, so they mentioned, I think either in this review or something else that I read, that um, microglia, um, even though when you damage bits of the brain, they become very, you know, we're not supposed to say it, but like active, they send processes out and start. They're already active, they're just active in a uh, different way. <laughs> less homeostatic, they, they try to mm -hmm. repair things and you can see processes like coming and going and phagocytosing. Um, so they their hands and feet are moving around, but the cell body apparently is quite um, stable. Like they, it doesn't move very much, supposedly, over in the imaging. In the homeostatic state, like over the imaging session. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also, I also read, I think in this paper, that if you deplete all your microglia using like a CSFR1 antagonist, um, mm -hmm. which you talked about last time when you presented, um, these microglia come back like quite quickly, like within a month or something. So I'm wondering, like with all these cell lineage tracing, is what is the normal lifetime of a microglia? Like all these different states that come and go, is it actually mm -hmm. the same cell that is very long lived, like a neuron, yeah. and then just yeah. cycling through different, going through different states, or is it actually new cells that come online? Yeah, great question. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I have a so the I mean the cells that I've that I've been working on are specific to the subventricular zone at, at within the first two weeks of life, and um, you know they they start showing up in mice. Uh, they are also present in human and non-human primates, but you know, I'm more familiar with their dynamics in mm -hmm. mice. But they start showing up at the end of gestation, and then they reach their peak at like seven days of postnatal life, and then by like day 14, two weeks in, they're gone. Where mm. did they go? I don't know. Um, but there's- The phagocytosed by themselves. <laughs> 
I actually think, so, I mean, certainly, yes, absolutely. I think some of them die. Why they die, I don't know. But um, there's a very recent paper. It's actually somebody from Ben Barris's lab who has kind of like latched onto this and is showing that they leave the, at least some of them, I don't know how many, but um, some fraction of them leave the subventricular zone and they migrate and they're in other places of the brain. And they, you know, they had this very specific, unique phenotype when they were in the SVZ in a one or two week old mouse. And they've, they've done it so that they can, they've labeled that cell and so that they can track it. But the phenotype that it had in the SVZ has disappeared and now it looks like something else. Hmm. But they know that at one point it so used to be tracing. a certain way. Right. Um, huh. And then, then they would, um, I think uh, this was, I can't remember if it was like a mouse model, like the 5X FAD mouse, the Alzheimer's disease model mouse, where it just as a function of age starts to accumulate or synthesize and accumulate amyloid beta and then has these like hit this, you know, uh, Alzheimer's disease like histopathology and cognitive decline. Um, or if it was one, if it was like some sort of acute, like they, you know, injured the brain somehow. But those cells, those specific cells that were in the SVZ and looked a certain way and then left it in the adult or, you know, like maturing animal and looked different become kind of revert to their SVZ you know, neonatal phenotype. And I just think that is fascinating. And I don't think that those enough of those studies have been done because I think that your question is maybe something that like, I don't know how it could not cross somebody's mind. Um, but they've done, they've done studies uh, like this with oligodendrocytes to see how stable they are. And they can live for many years and there's just like turnover of the myelin. Can um, I... Can I throw a spanner or a wrench into this lineage tracing uh, technique? Oh, so, please do, because I was going to do the same thing earlier with what uh, what Jason was talking about. We'll get to that, but yeah, oh, so <laughs> I would like love to. It, I would love to hear your wrench. Um, so, as far as I can tell, for lineage tracing, you have cells. You pulse in, You have cells that express a, like a fluorescent protein that you can trace along uh, across its lifetime, presuming that it keeps expressing it, um, kind of at a stable rate. Um, but these cells are microglia cells and they are kind of similar to macrophage. And I remember um, listening to one of Vincent's other podcasts, maybe it's TWIM, where they found that macrophages are the reason why your tattoo is uh, staying where they are because mm -hmm. macrophage will engulf these ink and then they would die and other macrophage will engulf those dead macrophage. And then they would stay at roughly the same place. And it's a different cell. Um, but you can have mm -hmm. tattoo that stays on for like uh, decades. So I don't know whether your fluorescent protein would get engulfed and would still not be, you know, degraded. It probably will be degraded. So it probably is okay. Oh. But it's just weird that, it's just weird that, you know, outside your body, in your skin, these macrophages, uh, and go, like you can trace these macro, you can't do this tracing with, you know, an iron dye because you get the wrong results. As shown mm -hmm. by tattoos, but in the brain, maybe you, maybe you can. I don't know. It's a weird thing to think about. I think that the fluorescent tracers would be degraded. Those fluorescent proteins would be degraded. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the ink is. Like, why it wouldn't can't? I don't know what the like, you know, yeah, the chemistry. Yeah, is. So I'm like, guessing like just can. like heavy I metal accumulation. Is, yeah, the dye itself is just hard to break down in in a cell anyway, and mm -hmm. uh, and so then when a when the cell does get engulfed the, with a new cell, it doesn't it doesn't degrade that ink. But I I love that you're talking about this because I um, like it. It's funny um, when you look at single cell RNA sequencing papers on microglia, which we will talk about uh, a little bit. Um, like, does anybody take into account the fact that they're eating things, and so that like some of the RNA that's being amplified came from another cell, and like. So in the, there's a 2014 um, RNA-seq, bulk RNA, well, it was, no, it's not, it's not single cell, but it is bulk RNA-seq, but they did separate um, using like reporter lines. 
they did separate like oligodendrocytes from astrocytes and then and it was kind of like the gold standard like it was people were like oh fantastic now if i want to look at a gene i can just look it up in this very easy to use searchable database and we'll just like see if it's up or down or whatever and um then later as like you know when single cell kind of came online it was more easily accessible to people um there were some additional papers that said you know like the reason that this gene is looks like so I'll be a little bit more specific because it'll be easier. Um, like there was a gene that in the, the 2014 array, it was up, it was high in oligodendrocyte precursor cells, which are commonly marked by PDGF receptor alpha. Turns out PD, PDGF receptor alpha is also expressed by um, some perivascular cells, and so when they were using PDGF receptor alpha to take out all of the oligodendrocyte precursor cells, they were also taking perivascular cells. And so it turns out that that gene that we thought was upregulated in oligodendrocyte precursor cells is actually not expressed there at all, but it's expressed in perivascular cells that were inadvertently collected. Hmm. So I think, you know, being thinking about like, well, what are they eating? And like, does it go away or does it stick around? Or like, we just have to keep that stuff in mind. Um, Naively, I would have thought, since they're doing single cell nuclear sequencing and they're just looking at the nucleus, even if they um, engulf kind of neighboring cells RNA, maybe it wouldn't make it to the nucleus. But I'm I mean, under the impression if you're that doing nucleus, if you're doing the nucleus, there uh-huh. is single cell and then there's single nuclei RNA sequencing. And right. so, like what when Jason was saying, you know, sampling, uh, you know, cytoplasm or fluid from the cell. You know, we don't, we're actually, we, uh, what percentage of what we're seeing is actually from, if it was a microglial cell mm. or a macrophage, what percentage of what we're seeing is actually from the engulfing cell and what is from the engulfed cargo. And there are ways now to dif- to differentiate by um, like tagging, pro- or tagging RNAs that came from a particular, like uh, it's beyond, it's above my pay grade. Um, it's, it's beyond my current knowledge, but um, where you can tag the RNA and like genetically modify the animal so that its RNA is going to be tagged in a certain way so that when you were to do RNA sequencing, you would be able to tell where the, what, where the transcripts came, came from. And, you know, in that scenario, you probably, you would have to have like your mouse microglial, uh, microglia or macrophage and then, you know, introduce it to non-tagged cells, the cells that came from, uh, you know, uh, the, a, a cell that, or a, a mouse that wasn't genetically modified to be trackable in that way. Yeah, they, they usually use like these slightly modified amino acids that are not normally made. Um, and so you can sort of tag, pull them out through that way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, actually, is, is it that that's the ribo tag mice? I mean, that's no, that, protein. That, that, those mice allow you to tag the ribosomes that are translating. Right, right, right. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to go down that road, but that is also very interesting. The question of is it be, it's there, but is it being translated? Yeah. Is it yep. you know very very interesting and probably also something that needs to be <laughs> taken into account. Um, so anyway, you have all these, yeah. Basically, um, with and so the RNA sequencing technology has been um, instrumental in making things more complicated <laughs> and interesting. <laughs> um, and uh, but there's, you know, we just really need to all be aware of the significant caveats, like some of which we were just discussing. Others are that like how you prepare your tissue is going to change what you see, um, how you gate uh, before you do, before you do single cell RNA sequencing, you have to, if you take like the full, like a, a chunk of brain, you might use fluorescence or magnetic based cell sorting to isolate different populations and tag them differently. Um, so like how you gate them or how well your magnetic Based sorting, uh, is how well that works is going to impact what you see. Um, there's kind of like these inherent biases, um, amplification biases that happen that um, in the process of the RNA sequencing. 
And then um, you can use different kinds of dimensionality reduction algorithms that, you know, they land, they create those like nice, cool plots that we've seen that are like very beautiful um, and like instantly get you published in like nature just just because you have them in data, your paper. Data dumps, <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. Um, with the and, right colors. <laughs> with, yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, you know, you can choose different algorithms and there are things like, you know, they, everybody's like, oh, well, that's unsupervised, unbiased. And it's like, mm, actually not really because you have to input into it. Like uh, once two points become this distance far away versus this distance uh, far away from each other, then you either, then you can count them as two separate pot, uh, two separate states or groups or clusters. Uh, but you can change that the 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 um, stringency of that. So those are just some things that we need to to keep in mind. And um, so then it all comes down to their recommendations, right? Some of this stuff has has come up during our discussion. They, you know, you have to be open to thinking about microglia um, as existing in a highly dimensional space, not on a not a you know, it's not a dichotomy. So just try to avoid using those kind of bipolar. Um, uh, definitions, and then avoid using acronyms. Sorry, Vivian. Quick uh, question: yeah, Do you think ma- sure. do you think microglia have more variability um, inherently um, compared to like astrocytes or like oligodendrocytes? Like, that uh, I'm guessing for neur- neurons, it's just going to be boring and just stay the mm-hmm. same, oh, except yeah. for like immediate early well, gene, like arc. Yeah. I was going to say <laughs> mm, maybe not. Well, I was going to say, we'll probably find out, you know, 20 years from now that we were, that what you said is just totally wrong or something. No, I'm, I'm wondering um, that. I don't even know whether neurons, because so, I, I know neurons so, also yeah. can change in terms of the, even the neurotransmitter that they express, yeah. um, that they make. So I wrote down, I have like this little document with my notes in it, and I have like a series of questions that I have that this made, you know, that I've been thinking about or this. And, and uh, one of them is like, you know, like in, in, when we talk about synapses and plastic, synaptic plasticity, there's a concept of there's the concept of metaplasticity, which is like how plastic is your ability to be plastic, and I think that's related to the question you just asked, um, and like how uh, sensitive are microglia or are microglia more or less or just as sensitive to like epigenetic modifications, you know, does so, like, does methylation, acetylation, all that stuff happen differently in microglia because they have to be so exquisitely sensitive and reactive to their environment? I don't know. Um, makes sense. Would be an interesting, you know, topic for somebody to build their life's work on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we should use the, so uh, we should use the word homeostatic instead of resting because there's never no rest for the weary. Um, we absolutely should not use the shape or protein expression of microglia to define, you know, what they are and what they're doing. Um, we shouldn't say reactive. You could say reacting to or responding to, and then you'd have to like list out the you know describe the context, and then use the word. Uh, state or to use clusters rather than subgroups or subpopulations. Um, and, and actually here they say, until a consensus is reached about the true subtypes of microglia mm-hmm. with defined ontogeny, physical niches, functions, and transcriptional profiles. And I was like, true microglia. What does that mean? Like, I, I, I actually don't think I agree with that. I think that it's it's um, somewhat hypocritical. But maybe it's just like. like removing all the inter lab variability from like all these calibrations and algorithms and mm. stuff at yeah, least at a minimal. Is, yeah. Do we do we really expect people to reach a consensus? Right? <laughs> That's, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's terrible, and they bring that up as like at the end that but, we have to pay attention to what we were doing in lab and all work together so that we're like all using the same, trying to use the same. Um, techniques and, you know, analyze these things with a certain set of criteria that have been decided on by the, you know. But I'd say it's super encouraging that the author list is like spans four pages. So it suggests that 
these microglia researchers are uh, doing single cell sequencing and then splitting all these different clusters out and then realize, hang on a minute, we're actually going into like completely uncharted territories. Mm. Let's come together and decide what to do. And this is, I think this is an amazing thing. That. Yeah, so actually um, there's, I, I would love to move from that to, I know we're, we don't have too much time, but I'd love to um, talk to you guys about an article that came out in the Atlantic just recently. So remind me to do that. But um, the, what I just want to say about the, something that this made, this paper made me think of was like, oh my gosh, do you realize um, like as somebody who's probably, who's going to be getting deeper into studying microglia, like I just suddenly started feeling a pit in my stomach because I said, I was like, do you realize what the implications of this are for how I'm going to undertake my research and what I'm going to have to do to be published and accepted by the group of microglia researchers? I mean, every single paper is going to take five years and is going to be, you know, cell level stuff. Like where it's like you looked at all the different possible, just you just did everything all at once, you know, all the time. Um, and that's, you know, like. But I, I don't think they're mandating that, right? I mean, I think um, that's, and that's the goal for consensus is sort of saying, okay, well, we all sort of agree that this marker is making, um, is, is sort of allowing us to say that this is the state of that, that um, cell. Um, but I think it's premature if you don't know what all the functions are yet. And so that's the key is sort of like be agnostic to gene expression mm -hmm. and whatnot. And just say like, we have a very specific way of manipulating mm -hmm. this cell type in this context under these conditions <laughs> to, to, to then define the function. Yeah. I just think that like, this is a tough time to be, it's an exciting time, but it might be a tough time to enter into this field because well, certainly, you, you know, always I, have to be keeping an eye out. Like I have this paper that we're going to submit to nature neuroscience next week. And I'm like, I'm going to have to go back and like rewrite some stuff, yeah. <laughs> you know, like cause I, I, we use acronyms because they're easy to, easy to use, but I don't know. It's just, it's hard to be a pioneer. Yeah. You know? But I think, and I, I've, I've seen this in the extracellular vesicle field where there was this whole mm -hmm. um, society that was started just to classify the different kinds of vesicles. And this is way before we even knew any functional readouts or any sort of biogenesis or how the, you got, got these final things. And, um, and then you'd have to sort of, when you published a paper on vesicles, you had to acknowledge that, you know, this this is the nomenclature that they had chosen. And you sort of say, well, I'm going to try and stick this um, finding in that nomenclature, even if it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that's what you have to do is just write some little thing in there that's like, listen, I know it's not perfect. I know I cannot reflect the true, you know, the platonic ideal of, the world in this paper because you have a word limit and you know <laughs> and I can't put in all of my 15 figures yeah. um, but so yeah. my kind of like philosophical takeaway from this is that um, and <laughs> this is like reminiscent of the realization I had in like my junior or senior year of college when I took the uh, neuroscience class where I was like oh, we're never gonna know anything <laughs> it was just it just I think that in order for us to like understand microglia, we are going to have to stretch, to like truly understand that we're gonna to have to stretch our minds to the limit of our ability to reimagine our world uh, and keep in mind a number of dimensions that we do not normally encounter in our daily life. And also it's like almost, it's like on the level of trying to imagine what's outside the universe. Like, you're like, oh, I mean, you know. uh, <laughs> what's outside the, I thought there was nothing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but nothing is something, you know, it, it's, um, well, that's a philosophical I, I saw, <laughs> I saw someone on Twitter make the statement that, um, that why haven't, why has, you know, whatever biologists are doing is very easy and he couldn't wait until software could take 
you know, take over from yeah, uh, experimental yeah. science because clearly biology is very simple and that's why we haven't solved disease. <laughs> You're just like, <laughs> um, this is one example of the complexity that we cannot really even fathom yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that uh, just to take it like that much deeper into philosophy is I, getting back to the very beginning where they were talking about like, you know, biology has from, it, biology's approach for better or for worse has been to categorize things. And I mentioned, you know, that I don't know much about this, but I do remember in grad school learning about like c- categorization um, that humans, you know, it's an animal, but is it a dog or is it a cat? Like this is something that children do we probably, we as adults are probably leading them into it, it um, to some extent, or maybe it's a reflection of truly like how our brain codes information and how it has to hire, you know, create a hierarchy of some sort. But, you know, language is based on that. You know, there's a structure uh, to language and clearly the way we use language to talk about microglia is is just, you know, there always needs to be the little asterisk that says like, okay, you know, but keep in mind that like the words I have are not good, you know? So like, how do we dissociate the way we, our language, the way we speak and think to s- dissociate that or to make it match to this? Well, I think this is just um, a normal progression of a field. And I think to, to what Tim said, which is that it's sort of pretty cool to see mm-hmm that the microglia fields matured to this point even where mm-hmm. now they're arguing over uh, nomenclature and different functions. And there's enough basic knowledge there to say that there are these different functions, there are these different states that these cells can take. So I'm not as I'm um, so optimistic. optimistic about <laughs> understanding it. I think, you know, it's just that that's where we're at in the field. But mm-hmm. um, so I think it's... That makes me know, feel good. Yeah. Yeah, I feel a little less hopeless now. Um, <laughs> so Vivian, is there no other cell in the body like this? Oh, uh, that I, I would think that there, I think that microglia are not alone. Okay, how about, <clears throat> how about the macrophages in uh, different organs? Like, do they suffer as much as, like a liver, a liver macrophage biologist? Are they also in this quandary? Where I don't know, like, can we invite oh somebody? God. Here, who's going to answer that question? Because I don't know what the answer is to that. But I think um, I would say that there's probably, well, no, that's interesting, actually, because like immunology has been around for, or like people have been, like that's an old field. It's very, uh, Mm -hmm. it's been worked on a lot by a lot of people. And um, there must be, Papers, I, or I wonder if there are papers out there that are like, hey, you know, T cells or whatever. It's, they're oh. way more complex than we thought they were. I think well, they have, so. they use cell surface. Well, initially they use cell surface markers, right? They could do flow mm-hmm. cytometry and define new T cells by high and low, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And they get published. And then the, the key is what, whether you can associate them with any function. And sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. And now we go beyond that into transcriptomics, right? And then you get much more noise as a consequence. And I'm not sure it uh, it helps you in any way. So, but the problem here is that this is a population of cells with a lot of different with different states and different functions. And so I can't think of other cells that are like that because you know it's the body is all about specialization, right? Yeah. Uh, so generalists are pretty rare, and it may be that the microglia is a pretty rare kind of. I just don't know enough about other cell types. I, I think I don't either. Part of the issue will be that uh, some of these functions are not are secondary to whatever manipulation you've done, and and I think there will be sure. sort of sure. some core key functions that emerge. And right now, it's just a bit of a mess because yeah. the the ways that we think we're manipulating these cells are either sledgehammers or they they may not they may not be as specific as we think they are. So I think it's just the state of the field, as as well as the fact that they are dynamic and they're doing a lot of things in the brain for sure. Yeah, it's it's both a, a hard time but a super exciting time to be yeah. jumping into this. 
Um, and so I don't know if did it, did he, anybody here have a chance to look at the article that I sent around to you guys from the Atlantic, which is uh, there. You know, it's always a little bit alarmist, but I think the point of journalism is to try to is to stimulate conversation. Is is this on um, Slack? Is this based on this um, Nature paper that came out about um, disrupting disruption of science? Could be. Um, yeah, yeah the, I think maybe yes, we, we slate that is. for another conversation because we're sort of running out of time here. But because right. um, I Stay think tuned. There's a, for next week, <laughs> next <laughs> yeah. month. What do you call that in the business? You know, a teaser, a cliffhanger. Right. Get people to come back. The consolidation disruption index is alarming. Science crummy has a cr- paper problem. A crummy paper problem. I agree totally, but let's talk about it another time. Oh, there's okay. a, so yeah, yeah. There's, this, there's even more to it about crummy papers now. <laughs> yeah, we, you're right. We should definitely talk about this because there's actually, you know, there's high dimensionality when you're talking about crummy papers. <laughs> crummy papers talk- for different reasons. <laughs> yeah, there was this Nature paper that came out recently. It also suggested that the uh, disruptive science um, is decreasing, and the way that, but the, the way that they um, uh, defined disruptive science was just a paper that came along and then suddenly had a bunch of citations that in the field because it sort of disrupted the, the existing dogma. And then this sort of a, this one nature paper then in in the in the sort of Twitter Twitter world or science world erupted and, and the conclusion was, oh, we're, we're not as innovative and we're not, you know, doing innovative science anymore. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Anyway, it's, I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts. A lot of thoughts. So do you think we could do uh, a whole episode on this article, a crummy paper problem? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Cause like I said, it's, um, there's multiple meanings of crumminess, you know, um, and then I think it also, I think it also, it, it would, it's, there's another component of this that's talking about publication and yeah. funding and to what, at least the way I read it, to what extent the, are the choices we make about what we study determined by, um, well, I mean, obviously, you know, funding sources, that kind of makes sense, but, um, but the journals and, um, you know what ideas are gonna get people more read, could get journals more subscriptions and reads and stuff like that. And yeah. journals are like competing, and you know there's this whole strategy that I think we as the scientists are maybe not aware of, or maybe we don't take it into account. I don't know. I just feel like there are that that whole. I just feel like there are so many interesting questions left left on the table, but they're maybe not being picked up and I'd like to know why. And I, I wonder if that- I just wonder, so, I mean, from, obviously scientists are sort of grappling or academia is grappling with a lot of these issues of uh, peer review and, and publications. And, um, but from, a, from the public standpoint, you know, I think what's not transparent is what to believe. What are the good papers? What are the bad papers? And uh, because there are protagonists in, in um, that are sort of running with whatever cherry picked data they want to make a, a message. And we're talking about life or death. Like I'm sure Vincent, you know, is getting this all the time where these, um, there are scientists now just sort of arguing about COVID and, um, like the latest one is what, whatever's going on with the immune system and is, is COVID as bad as HIV in <laughs> <laughs> affecting the immune system yeah. And um, and you have legit scientists that are sort of saying something, and then uh, you know, um, I just wonder how we're going to grapple with this idea of misinformation. And of course, science—that's how science works. There are sort of going to be conflicts, and and scientists are going to disagree on data and interpretation. But from the public's standpoint, they're like, "Well, no, it has to be this or that. It can't be something else." <laughs> yeah, that, another they have way to relate it. They have the wrong view, obviously, right? Because they don't know how science works. But right. that's that's because it's taught badly at school. Yeah, I mean, that's really the case, and I mean, that's Is what it we try and do. at school. <laughs> and that's what no, we it, try and do here on on all these podcasts is to try and help you to be able to distinguish. I mean, we have. Uh, 
I had a question the other day. So we have a, I have a um, a list of COVID papers on uh, our web, Micro TV website, and someone said, "Well, can you put next to each one whether it's good or bad?" <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "No, <laughs> I'm not going to do that because." I, I just don't want to insult people, right? And because then it starts an argument. Well, why do you think this is bad? But I said you should. It's going to be hard for you to figure out on your own because you're not a scientist. But uh, mm -hmm. sometimes we'll discuss them, and we may talk about the limitations. But I think doing that leads you down uh, a difficult pathway, right? But uh, yeah. this is not a a new thing with COVID. That's the point. It's been around for for many years before. It's just been exacerbated because of the publishing situation. And preprints have uh, exacerbated it even more, right? Because they're not even peer-reviewed. And then we have the so-called Twitter peer review, which is not yeah. really peer review. It's just, it's just mouthing off, right? <laughs> right. Well, that's even worse where it's sort of just my opinion counts just as much as um, yeah. someone yeah. who just Googled the word COVID. <laughs> So, exactly. so, so the solution of like making reviewers um, comments and and back and forth public, so that you can judge for yourself what other scientists think about this, that, that might not be a good solution because it would just be drowned out by everyone. I don't well, know. I think well, that's an interesting because like that turn might be one events. way of judging I, whether I it's think a good it's paper. Interesting. So um, some journals do that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they publish yeah. their reviews, and um, now. They're also, um, some journals are also asking, I mean, it's a little bit different, but they're also saying you need to provide all of your data. Yeah. Like the raw data in a spreadsheet. I saw that the other day. I don't know I what's the like, point, unless it's properly formatted so that other people can use it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's like, you know, Who's gonna go spreadsheets through it? where it's yeah. like, but, oh, but uh, hopefully, hopefully, as Jason men Jason mentioned earlier, some software and some artificial intelligence software in the future will be able to go through it and then just come up with better experiments than scientists mm -hmm. actually do. <laughs> There's also um, MBio has a review process where um, so you pick your reviewers and you write to them and say, "We are you willing to review?" our paper under these conditions. You send them the manuscript. They send you the reviews. It's all mm. open, so you know who it is. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then you address the comments. You send them back, and you go back and forth until they say, yeah, we'll, we'll accept this or not. And then you send all that correspondence into the editor, and they decide finally whether they publish it or not. Mm. Interesting. And makes people a little more... We, we have done... I think we did our last paper that way. And um, people are very civil as opposed to anonymous reviews where they can mm -hmm. write, you know, this is the worst paper ever. Yeah. If you're not going to say something nice, don't say it at all. <laughs> or if you're not going to say something constructive. Anonymity, you, you know, hiding behind in anonymity is uh, unbelievable, right? People yeah. just go crazy. So I just think more reveal is better, but it has to be regulated. Twitter is not regulated in any way, and you have all kinds of people weighing in and people get hot-headed. But if you had it regulated as it is in a journal, you know, where you have to write an email and you send them to, to – I think that can work in a broader way. But, you know, mm -hmm. but it's obviously – this is a cool topic, so at some point we should talk about it and in the context of this paper. It'd be interesting, yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right, uh, that is t twin number thirty-seven. Uh, I guess it's the first one for twenty twenty-three, right? Yeah, it is. Well, it's the first one recorded in twenty twenty-three. Yeah, I released uh, the last year one in twenty twenty-three, but yes, you can find show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. You can send your questions and your comments to twin at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy what we do here, we would love to have your financial support. We're trying to build basically a science education communication company that will endure, which is unlike any other that's that has existed. It's uh, largely composed of scientists who donate their time. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah. Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Twitter. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, everyone.
It's a good handle, Jason Synaptic. I really <laughs> like that. Tim Chung is at New York University. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Vivian, for that paper. Learned a lot. And Vivian Mars is at Tulane University. Thank you, Vivian. Thanks, guys. It was a good discussion. I am Vincent Racaniello. Where can you find me? Well, uh, you can, let's say just go to microbe.tv. That's where our work is. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Thank you.